Luke chapter 13, intelligent Holy Spirit, I pray that in the next few moments, I'll be able to exhort truth in such a way that these dear people will be edified, blessed in every area of their lives. Consume us with the fires and flames of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Now there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans, 13 chapter of Luke, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Think about the World Trade Center and maybe the Pentagon when I read this. I tell you no, but unless you repent, which really means to rethink, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell. Or the 3,000 when the Trade Towers fell. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others in New York? Or Jerusalem, scripture says here. I tell you no. But unless you rethink or repent, reevaluate how you perceive things that happen around you, you too will all perish then he told this parable a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it but didn't find any so he said to the man who took care of the vineyard for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any cut it down why should I use it why should it use up the soil I'm reading out of the New International Version sir verse 8 the man replied Leave it alone for one more year. Now dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Turn to somebody and say, one more year. They began asking this question, seeing that people had been killed. Pilate was known for his impulsive anger. He would... Uh, at the drop of a head just go off and he killed people and he was brutal at times and so the Jews had seen him kill people in the temple while they were worshiping God other Jews who seemed like the sweet saints and they were questioning why bad things happen to good people why bad things happen to innocent people why God allows us to go through some of the misfortunes we go through Viktor Frankl, the late Holocaust survivor who died in his 90s in Germany just a couple of years ago, a psychiatrist, wrote a book titled The Meaning of Life. And he said in that, in that book, to, to live is to suffer. To survive is to find meaning in the suffering. Paul said, man born of a woman's of a few days and full of trouble, tumult, quiverings in Hebrew, shakings, violence, emotions, especially anger. And fear. Man born of a woman of a few days and full of challenges. Somebody said living life is, is, is for some people nothing more than a sexually transmitted disease. Disease. And it's incurable. And it's terminal because we all ultimately die. But it's not untreatable. We spend most of our time trying to treat the dis-ease of living trying to be comfortable in our own skin. We come to meetings like this to get a little treatment because we don't know how to cure it. In fact, every few minutes, you're going to shift your weight in that chair, move your toes and pull your earlobes and trying to adjust to being you. Like to kick them shoes off, rest them corn and bunions and relax. And Come on. Trying to be you. They say that 80% of the dust that's found in anybody's home is human skin. Because you're shedding constantly. And between our realities and God's absolutes, there is an obscure place where most of us tend to get trapped or entrapped. The Bible says we see through a glass dimly or darkly. We know in part. We prophesy in part. We have lots of questions. And questions are answers in seed form. It takes talent to answer them, but it takes genius to ask them. Why am I here? 
These folk were struggling with why these folk died, but the question is really not why did they die, why did others die, but why did not I die? Or why am I still here? Not why did the Pentagon get attacked and why did the trade towers come with that? Those are good questions, but, but why do all those people die? And why, do, why are folks at, at, at ICU right now just call to the, to the emergency tonight? But why are you still here? Why are not you dead? All of you can probably mark some close brushes with death. Why didn't you fall down a, a, a flight of steps and break your neck in, in the last several years of your life or even this week? Some of you don't even realize, but just sitting there, I don't care how, how much you try to wash and clean, there's bacteria everywhere on doorknobs, on handles, and, and the food you cook. And if you ever put your hand under a black light, you're going to see there's little living things look like pieces of dust all over you. And it'll startle you at first. You get to bushing and pushing, and they won't go anywhere. And there's something else living on them, and something living on that, and something living on that, and all of them got an appetite. You have mites in your eyebrows, in your hair. Millions of them, like fleas on a wild dog's back, but you don't know it. You know why you're not dead? Because you're not finished. God's given you one more year to dig around and get some stuff right in your life. Suffering and misfortune were popularly explained as punishment for sin in Jesus' day. Jesus did not accept that theology. In fact, his own experience... It's a complete contradiction of it because he suffered so much, not because he was a bad Jesus. But he did suffer because of our sin. He did the go, go through misfortune in many ways. But we tend to think that when bad things happen, that, that, that it's because people did bad things and sometimes that is why bad things happen. But a lot of times bad things happen because you're doing something right. The Bible says no weapon formed against us will prosper. But he didn't say there wouldn't be weapons, he didn't say they wouldn't be formed, and he didn't say they wouldn't be against us. So here he's trying to explain to them, don't ask why they died. Find out why you're still here and what you're supposed to do with your life. I've been 40 for going on nine years. Which means I'm almost 50. I'm trying to decide what to do with the second half of my life. Because before I got married, my focus was destiny, where I'm going with my life. When I got married and had my children, I started thinking about legacy, what I leave behind. When I turned 40, I began to think about mortality, the fact that I'm going to die. I'm, I'm assured to die. I, I got destiny in front of me, legacy behind, and now I'm thinking about accuracy. How can I live an accurate, precise, thorough, exact life? Ex uh, expediency or, or excuse me um, um, experience is is something you uh, uh, you you encounter in life experiences that are experiments you're studying and testing and learning by all these things you go through and as you look at life and the things that you are experimenting testing out trying to find your way through there are obscure places and you ask for God to shed light on what you're doing so you can do it with clarity I want to be exactly the man God called me to be and when I crossed over into this new year's I said Lord this new year a couple of nights ago I said Lord thank you that you're giving me one more year to dig around to fertilize to weed things out I just need one more year to get some stuff right in my life tell tell somebody I just need one more year and I'm going to work on me in ways I've never worked on me before. I'm going to work on my life, my marriage, my ministry, my mind, my attitude, my thoughts. I'm going to get some stuff together. And everything the devil stole from me, I'm going to get it back this year. I am not going to accept defeat. When Job's wife said to him, why don't you just curse God and die? The word curse there doesn't mean to execrate or to denounce God. She said, if you look it up in Hebrew, why don't you just yield to this disaster as if it's God's will? He wants to kill you, so go on and die. Why don't you accept the fact that your life is messed up, it's going to be messed up. Accept the fact that you, you, your life is jacked and it ain't going to change. That's the, essentially what she was saying. He said, oh, no, no, no. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I know my Redeemer lives. And somehow, I'm going to find my way through this. 
That's why I don't stop. Because of something that hinders me along the way. Because it's really not what you're going through, it's what you're going to. Tell somebody I'm on my way to a wealthy place. Tell them I ain't seen nothing yet. I'm just getting started here. I'm just about to kick it in. I just need one more year. And I'm going to get some stuff so straightened out that demons are trembling. My God. Tell the person next to you, say, next year I'm liable to be a millionaire. One more year I'm liable to be completely debt free. One year from now I'm liable to be on a brand new yacht with a brand new jet and a, every bill paid off. My God, one year from now everybody in my family is liable to be born again. Come on, tell somebody I'm on my way to a wealthy place. I'm not about to stop you. All, all I need is one more year. Come on, high five someone and say, one more, just one more, God. And of course, at the end of that year, you're going to say it one more time. Throw in another one, Lord. Until I get to where I'm going. I want to show you something over there in the book of Isaiah for a second. Tell somebody, just one more year. One more year. One more year. Mm -hmm. You know, we have our fastings every year. We, 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 around January for the first 21 days, we actually won't start until next Monday. We get together as a church and we seek the face of the Lord and everybody's praying and pushing the food away. And some people go on a Daniel's fast. They just eat, you know, nuts and fresh fruits. And some people just have juice and some go total abstinence for the first several days or the whole 21 days or whatever. And we begin to seek the Lord and say, Lord, let me dig deep. Let me fertilize. Let me dig around. Let me see what I need to get straight in my life what I need to shed, what baggage I need to leave behind. Some of those are friends you need to leave behind. People that have been sucking you dry. People that are draining you, people who do not want to go where you're going. People who have no idea and don't really care, they're gonna hold you back. Being unequally yoked is not just hanging around with folks that are, don't believe in Jesus. Being unequally, yoked, being unequally yoked is hanging around with folks who don't believe in your potential. You don't fit with them, you don't match with them. Let them go. If you hang around with folks who believe in your potential, it doesn't matter how far you fall. They'll always pull you back up because they believe in where you're going. Where you're going to, not what you're going through. High five somebody one more time and say, I'm on my way to a wealthy place. Sometimes I get in trouble. Sometimes I make mistakes. Sometimes I do stupid stuff. That's why I like to say that we're not just human beings looking for spiritual experiences. We are spirits having an earthly encounter. I have a body and I have a mind, but I am a spirit. And the part in me that hears the echo is the spirit that got original instructions from God before he gave me a mind and a body. He spoke something into my spirit. And when he decided my destiny, then he told my mom and daddy to make love. And between three and four hundred million microscopic seed from my daddy chased the one egg my mother released. And all of them died except the one that fertilized it. And when that egg was fertilized, instantly my genetic code was established. And my DNA was stamped on every cell in my body. In other words, and this goes for all of us, we didn't accidentally show up here. We're here on purpose. Because 60% of fertilized eggs don't live. The mother loses it. She can hear me, she can lose it. But, but somebody had to decide which one of those fertilized eggs lived. Nudge the person next to you and say, I'm supposed to be here. Say, I'm empowered to be here. Say, there's so much anointing in me and so much appointing in me and God has invested so much in me. Tell them, if you knew how much God invested in me, you'd probably pay me to let you sit next to me. You stand in line and scalp tickets just to get in the same room I'm in because I got so much anointing on my life. Demons tremble when I wake up in the morning. Look at someone and say, I got power. Power, yeah. Lord, I got some power in me. I'm supposed to be here. And God keeps giving me years to dig around and fertilize and weed stuff out and get my life together. 54th chapter of Isaiah. This is what the Lord gave me in, res in, in response to this terrible tragedy that took place on September 11th. For a brief moment. I abandon you. Seventh verse of the 54th Isaiah. For a brief moment, 
I left you exposed. For a brief moment, <clears throat> I cleared my throat and the World Trade Centers came down. I batted my eyes and the Pentagon became vulnerable. For a brief moment, I abandoned you, but with deep compassion, the Queen King James says, great mercies, I'll bring you back. Passionate, compassionate restoration. Nudge someone say, I've been through some stuff, but I'm on my way back. 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 Come on, say it. I'm on my way back. We're on our way back, America. We're on our way back, D.C. We're on our way back, church. We've been through some stuff. And he says, in a surge of anger, a little wrath, short-lived outburst because of mistakes and missteps, I hid my face from you for a moment. Temporary absence. The Bible says, for this cause we faint not, though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day, while we look not at the things which are obvious, seen, for the things which are conspicuous and obvious and seen are temporary. Things which are not seen are eternal. The word temporary in Hebrew or in Greek means the equivalent of they are vagabonds, they're hobos, they, they're fugitives. These things that are, that are conspicuous are just riding around the train tracks of your mind and ain't got no ticket. Hobos. Living there with name, paying no rent. They don't own you. They're just hanging out in your thought life. These are temporary. So look at the things that you, look for the things you can't see. Say that. That's what Abraham meant when he said, I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. For a brief moment, for a flash of a second, I abandoned you. But with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Skip down to the 15th verse. If anyone does attack you, it ain't going to be me. <laughs> it's not my doing. Bad things happen to good people. And I allow bad things to happen, but I don't do the bad things. I, God allowed the devil to attack Job's body and his family. He couldn't do it. Nothing can happen to you without God's permission. And if God allows it to happen, that means God knows something about you that the devil doesn't even know about you. That what the devil means for not, God's going to turn it for good. The steps of a good man or woman are ordered or ordained by the Lord. He delights. We get confused. We get mad. We protest and complain. He delights in his way. Though he fall and good men fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. You can't be absolutely cast down. You cannot be ultimately cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. The word uphold there in Hebrew means the Lord literally props you up. Because you can't stand up on your own. You limp and cripple and doing dumb, stupid stuff. And the Lord just props you up. In him I live. In him I move. In him I have my being, my essence. Everything that I am because I'm wrapped up and tied up and tainted all up in Jesus. I'm like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. I bring forth my fruit in my season. Whatever I do will prosper. Oh, hallelujah. My leaf shall not wither. Tell somebody I'm on my way to a wealthy place. The Bible said they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their own testimony. Remember that word overcome is Nikai, where we get the word Nike. Remember Nikes? It means victory, success. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. They overcame, they had their Nikes on. <laughs> Look at someone and say, I got my Nikes on. <laughs> say, the devil can bruise my heel, but I can crush his skull. I got my Nikes on. They overcame, they came over. I came through by the blood of the Lamb. And the word, the logos, the logic of my own tests, testimony. The word logos is where we get the word logic, the rationale, the reasoning behind every test. Look at someone and say, there's divine logic behind every test. There's a reason for every test, every trial. It all works together for my good because I love the Lord and I'm called according to his purpose. 
If anyone does attack you, it'll not be my doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. Ultimate victory. You have line item veto power. Because sometimes the devil packages a bunch of stuff. Some good things are in there to, to disguise the bad things. But the Holy Ghost helps you line item veto. Say, no, that, I'll X that out. That ain't going to happen. I'm not going to let that. Whatever the enemy ultimately plans for me is not going to happen. But bad things do happen to good people. And he says, if anybody does attack you, it's not going to be you. So tell somebody, whatever I'm going through has to ultimately surrender to me. Whatever has attacked me, whatever has lacked me, will surrender to me. I'm going to win this thing. I'm coming through this thing. All I need is one more year. Ah, I'm going to weed it out. Dig around. Whew. Now he says, see it is I who created the blacksmith, who fans the coals into flame, forges the weapon to fit for its work. In other words, ultimate authority is in my hand. I'll have the last word. It's I who created the destroyer, the waster, to work havoc. In other words, it's God's devil. He's on God's payroll. And he's going to get his just pay in the lake of fire. He can't do nothing without God's permission. Oh, hallelujah. I say that scares some of you when I say that, but God ultimately is in control. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. 17 verse says, and no weapon formed against you will prevail. It's not going to prosper. No weapon, no conspiracy. A conspiracy is a, is a, is a, convo, uh, a convening of spirits. Spiracy. Conspiracy. No congregation of spirits that are formed or forged against you will prosper. They're not going to prevail. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. Oh, hallelujah. I don't care what they say about me. It's what God says about me. It's not what they call me. It's what God calls me. For this is the inheritance. This is the estate of the saints. This is my lot in life to win these battles. Somebody say glory. glory. Come on, say it again, glory. glory. High five somebody and say, I'm on my way to a wealthy place. I simply believe, and I love this statement. I'm quoting Tim House. I simply believe that there is a mystery of the ordinary. That the commonplace is full of wonder. And that this life that we all call Christian is different from what we think it is. It's infinitely more subtle, more powerful, more dangerous, more magnificent, more exciting, more humorous, more delicious, more adventurous, more involved, and more troublesome than most of us think. Helen Keller said, I don't just want the peace that passes all understanding. I want the understanding that brings about peace. She said, I will not just live my life. I will not just spend my life. I will invest my life. Right now, in 2002, we're all having to take inventory. The psychologists tell us that we're experiencing as a nation post-traumatic stress. Because we've been on sustained high alert now for all, going into the fourth month. They don't know where Osama bin Laden is. And one of the reasons they can't find him is because he's in cahoots with the prince of the darkness of this world. The prince of the secrets. They can't find him with all our sophisticated surveillance. Remember when an unclean spirit leaves a person and goes into deserts. There's a mystical aspect to Islam that many people never understand. The moon gods and all those things they, they, they worship. Saddam Hussein is a practicing witch. He's a wizard. They're spiritual. And most folk don't know it. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Some men trust in chariots. Some men trust in horses. But we remember the name of the Lord. And another thing you've got to realize, and I'll say this to the appropriate people at the right time. If you want peace in the Middle East. You've got to understand that you're dealing with the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Isaac. Ishmael and Isaac are brothers. Same daddy, different mothers. But every time Ishmael was sent away, even when his mother was pregnant with him as a single parent, 
God sent an angel to look after him. Before he was born and after he was about 15 years old, she was got sent away again, a single mother with one teenage kid, and she was crying. God sent an angel again. So if God will send an angel to take care of Ishmael, we can't mistreat him either. I know some of y'all don't like that. But there have to be proper coexistence in Israel. Because Ishmael is angry saying, this is my God too, and my, my father. I mean, Abraham is my daddy. And when Abraham was realized that after, after 25 years he'd waited for prophecy, then God speaks to him and says, about this time next year, you're going to be pregnant the way I told you. I mean, your wife Sarah is going to be pregnant. You're going to have a son the way I told you you were going to have a son. And Abraham said, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. One more year from now? I'm 99. Sarah is 90. Sarah's talking about Abraham. <laughs> you better get on away from here. I can't hardly walk, and you talking about kids? Don't even come in the tent, Abraham. I got a headache, and they ain't made aspirins yet. I ain't never heard of Benny. Don't come in this tent. Abraham's thinking, honey, face without works are dead. We got to try a little something other here. He was 75. Ten years later, he's 85 and still no baby. And so Sarah makes a suggestion to modify the instructions and says, let's, let's help God out because it's taking him too long. Here's my maid servant, Hagar. And Abraham is 85 years old, or 95. She's now, you know, he's, he's 85, she's 75. It's been 10 years since the original prophecy. And Hagar is young and tender, and Sarah don't feel right. And probably don't look right. And Abraham looks at that young, tender Hagar, and look at that old me, Sarah, and say, wait a minute here. I don't usually obey you, baby, but I'm going to obey you today. If that's what you want me to do. So he's with Sarah, or with Hagar, and Ishmael is born. And the thing about Ishmael's is you can't kill them. Because they're part God. They came out of the same instruction. When God spoke to Abraham, Abraham was fertile. Even in his old age. His flame might have been going out, but his pilot light was still burning. You remember them pilot lights on? <laughs> Some of you young folk don't know what a pilot light is. You? That little pilot light was yet in there flickering, see. Now watch this. He produced the son. He's in love with the son. He thinks this is his posterity, his legacy his inheritance and then God says now about this time next year the kid is 15 years old you're gonna have it the way I told you and Abraham's thinking wait a minute you mean I'm gonna have a son by my wife Sarah 25 years after you spoke to me yes well what am I gonna do with Ishmael cuz I love Ishmael I raised Ishmael I taught him to fish and hunt and swim. I'm comfortable with Ishmael. Sure, I modified the instructions. Sure, I made an error, but I'm comfortable with this mistake. See, some of you, if God brought the perfect will in your life, it'll startle you so much you wouldn't know what to do. You're so used to being in debt. If, God, if you were debt free, you'd be... You're so used to putting your grandson's name on the phone bill and you lying, telling him I ain't here and... You're so used to manipulating your way through junk. If you did get dead for you, you wouldn't know what to do. You'd create, you'd create a crisis. That's what happens when people go through this post-traumatic stress. When, you, when the adrenaline hits you and the trauma hits you, they, they tell the story of a pregnant woman that well, had a two-year-old child and she backed over the child in the car one day and, and, and in her trauma, her adrenaline, with the adrenal glands you know, adjacent to the kidneys, secretes the kind of chemicals and and, 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 and uh, um, some kind of a stress reducing um, even sexual hormones come, come out of that, uh, that adrenal gland it'll stir you up and you'll feel like you can do she jumped out of the car pulled it up with one hand and pulled the baby out with the other now that's a high that's higher than some of these drugs and some of you can, can OD on adrenaline 
You overdose on it. You want so much of it until what happens is when the crisis is over and you lose the adrenaline, the, you plunge into a kind of depression. Watch this. And you like the high that you felt when the crisis was here. So you create another crisis. Just so you can get high with the adrenaline again. That's why you can't get your marriage out of trouble because you create trouble in there. You create trouble on the job. You create so you try to get sick just because you're addicted to the adrenaline that helps you get out of it. You are so used to the survival mentality, you don't know how to thrive. You just know how to survive. You've got to find something to be intense about. I don't care what you give some people. They're not going to be happy. They're going to be mad and fussing and depressed about something all the time. And I don't care how sweet it is, they're going to find something wrong with it because they are addicted to the drug that helps them get through it. You can OD on anger. You can OD on, on unforgiveness. You can overdose. You can be addicted to your own deadly negative emotion, your own self-pity. It's time for us to loose ourselves from this and come out of it. Tell somebody, I'm ready to come out right now. I'm, I'm on my way out right now. No weapon formed against me will prosper. I'm going to kick this thing aside. And God said finally to Abraham, when Abraham said, but that Ishmael might live under your blessing, God said, all right, I will bless it. But the covenant is with Isaac. But Ishmael is blessed. Look at me. He's still blessed. Out of the ten wealthiest landowners in the world, nine of them are sons of Ishmael. The only one that isn't is the Queen of England. You better hang out with some of them rich Arabs. <laughs> the way we can get peace, that peace is the war in Israel has moved to our soil now. You cannot mistreat God's inheritance, even if it was created in error. God said, I'm going to bless your mistake, but it's going to have to move over as I close so that the perfect will can come in. Turn to somebody and say, all the mistakes I've made over the last year are behind me now. Here comes Isaac. I'm going to laugh again. Hallelujah. The word Ishmael means ask for. The inference is manipulated for, begged for. And now you got it. And you're used to living with him. And now God says, about this time next year, you're going to have a major breakthrough. Whew. Tell somebody 12 months from now, my whole situation is going to be different. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Tell somebody one more time, 12 months from now, one year from today, about this time next year, I will have a major breakthrough in my life. About this time next year, Ishmael's going to have to back up for Isaac. About this time next year, I will have weeded everything out that didn't belong to it, and I'll be where I'm supposed to be in the will of God, and no weapon full against me will prosper. Come on, clap your hands and praise the name of the Lord if you believe it. Clap your hands and praise the name of the Lord if you believe it. Perception is the ultimate reality, but not necessarily the ultimate truth. We must learn how to distinguish between our creations and God's, or God's creations and our illusions. To know God totally rather than selectively. I've been in this all my life. And I'm having, an, I'm having miracles in my thinking because miracles are examples of right thinking. That's the kind of miracle you need. It sort of aligns your life with truth as God created it. That's the kind of miracles we need. You need a miracle in your thought life. You need a miracle in your attitude. Are you hearing me? A miracle is a, is a correction introduced into a, False, accurate thinking, inaccurate thinking. God is correcting and redirecting some of your thoughts. The way you perceive things, the way you look at things. Lord, heal our perceptions until knowledge of the divine is possible. Till I recognize God around me. Till I can see, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see. 
Blessed are those whose hearts are pure toward God, for they shall see their way through any and everything. You can see God through everything. You can almost see God in everything. You never get depressed because you see God in there somewhere. Your heart is pure. They will see, they will view, they will perceive God through everything. That unhappy situation at home, that wayward son or daughter, that situation on the job, you can see God in it. You can see God through it. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God. Not everything, but that you give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The word think in English comes from the word thank. And the word thank comes from the word think. A thinking person means somebody who is conscious of the benefits and is therefore thankful. First of all, supplication, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all men. Thanksgiving is the deepest form of prayer. Supplication is the weakest form. First of all, supplication. That means most folk come to prayer meetings begging, asking, petitioning. 911, paramedic, emergency prayer meeting. Supplication. Lend me, give me, let me have. God, I got to have a miracle. We never get into prosukamai prayer, which is to wish and want God. And therefore, we never get on into intuxis, which is intercession. Intercession means an intercession with God. An interview with God and an interview of God. When you get into intuxis, into the intercession, you see things in there, in the Holy of Holies. You're in there. Your view of God changes. And you see stuff and you say, my God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't have a need. Thank you. Lord, help me. Let me pray for somebody else who doesn't see what you have inside here. We've got to get past supplication into thanksgiving. Wrap your arms around yourself. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness. When he says rulers, that means delegated authority. The devil has some delegated authority to do some things on earth. That's why bad things happen. He's been given certain delegated He's the ruler of darkness, of secrets, of mysteries. Things that will never be explained. That's why we must pray ourselves through this present conflict. God will show you things in your home, in your family, in your own self. And start with you. Say, Lord, show me me. Before you try to change somebody, try to understand them. I have to take a good long look at myself how I'm going to respond to life as it comes to me. He said to those fellows, those people were not all bad just because they died. You need to repent or rethink. Thoughts lead to purposes. Purposes go forth in actions. Actions form habits. Habits decide character and character fixes our destiny. Thoughts are powerful. They're creative. They're almost inventive. Except you rethink, repent. John Baptist came repenting, the kingdom of God is near, it's among you. But I've got to lay the axe to the root. Let's get down deep and find out what's wrong with us. Don't just come here and let me trim a few branches off of you. Let Bishop, First Lady, trim, trim a few leaves off of you. Let's find out why you react the way you react. Why you can't handle your temper or your appetites or the anger? Why you struggle with this low self-image? Why you compare and compete with everybody? Why do you covet? Why are you always the victim? Who assigned you victimization? Preacher, you don't know I'm from such a dysfunctional family. Who isn't from one? Get over it. Good God. Jesus, his brothers thought he was crazy. 
Sometimes I have to say, why did I respond to my wife that way? You know, that was my little five-year-old daughter. I was brushing her teeth the other night, and I, and I had spoken irreverently to her, their mother in front of the, her, and I always apologize to my kids when I need to. I said, I said, Majesty Daddy, I don't apologize to you, sweetheart. I, that's not the way you carry a conversation. Um, I don't want to talk to your mother that way. I love her so much, and, and I wish I hadn't have said it that way. And Majesty went, well, next time, Daddy, just think about it. <laughs> Out of the mouth. When I talk to her that way, I get on her level, eyeball to eyeball. When I apologize, and sometimes you need to. Son, I didn't mean it that way. Come here. Or, baby, come here. Mama was tired. Just come here. She's a little tired. Let's, uh, she didn't mean that. Let her rest. Time it, brothers. You, you know about when she's going to act up. <laughs> it's long about the same time every few days. Watch that count. Oh, there it is. Come here, babies. Sweetheart, I'll do the dishes tonight. No, no, honey, I'll, let me take that. Uh, honey, I've got the bed turned back for you. Go rest. Go in there and turn that. I got a great big old whirlpool in it. That, they change in the tub. To turn the, I turned the lights down, put candles on, fill the tub up, put, put bath beads in there. Put on some Anita, I mean some uh, uh, Yolanda Adams. I'm sorry. I, I'm... I met Yolanda Adams, Shirley Caesar. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Bishop. Y'all have to forgive me. A little bit of the world came back in there. No, I know how to romance her and charm her. Because I'm not only sincere, I'm serious. Let me tell you, single lady, something. Something that we men tend to do. A man can charm you, call you, take you out, send you cars, roses, perfume, just make you feel like the most important thing in the world for months. And just stop. Just stop. And you won't see him for six months. Six months later, he'll show up wanting to take up where he left off. And you on Prozac and in counseling and therapy. That's our nature. And we try to figure what you have. We, I was just being nice. I was sincere, but he wasn't serious. There's a difference. Don't mistake somebody's sincerity for seriousness. Sincere means that they're pure in their motives. They're just pure. Mind. I take you out. I'm, I'll take that other woman out for a few days. But when he's serious, huh? Some of you just, just date God. You know, you ain't really ready to come to the altar. And you're sincere. You come to church sincerely. But you're not going to really commit and make a promise. And if you make a promise and break it, you become promiscuous. You have skewed the promise. That's where we get the word from. When you make a vow, you make a promise. The word devout really comes from our word vow. A devoted person is one who casts his vote toward God. In, our, in the way we break it down in English. How sincere are you about this year? And how serious are you? Father, in the name of Jesus, as we bring this service to a close, I pray the Spirit of God would so quicken intimate likeness of Christ to our hearts. Most of us in here tonight are sincere and some of us are serious. We really want to know what we're here for, why we're on this planet, why we did not die. Keep those eyes closed. Some 73,000 people could have been and should have been killed on September 11th. 50,000 of them just in the World Trade Center. The number is down to less than 3,000 that were actually killed, unaccounted for, I should say. 23,000 could have been killed in the Pentagon that day. I was talking to a person today that was supposed to have been there.
I cannot wait to hear the testimonies of those who try to explain how they were not sitting at their desk that morning. How many alarm clocks didn't go off? How many woke up with a baby that was a little bit sick or had a fever, or couldn't find their keys, missed the bus, missed the tram? How many woke up with a little headache that morning and said, I believe I'll sleep in, I'm not going to make it, and called in? Thousands of them, it wasn't their time to die, and that's why they're still here. Couldn't find a parking place, my normal parking place, so I drove around an extra block and missed a bomb. How none of those planes, who all could have carried two and three hundred people, none of them had, none of them were even half full. None of them were even a quarter full. They didn't, people got to the, all the way up to the counter and didn't have their ID and couldn't get on that plane, Bishop. Left something at home and ran back to get their idea, ran back to get their wallet, ran back to get their per ran back to pick up a piece of luggage and missed the flight. Good God from glory. And you're here today because it ain't time for you to die yet. God has given you one more year. One more year, one more year, one more day, one more moment, one more hour, one more second. And I'll seize that moment for Jesus Christ. I like to think that before a person dies, we usually think like in the movie Ghost, the person dies and then their spirit leaves, if you saw that movie. But what if before you die, your spirit leaves? Because you can't die as long as your spirit is still there. What if as those people jumped out of the World Trade Center, some 60 stories, some of them, and just before their bodies splattered against the ground, their spirit jumped out of them and they never felt a thing. What if just before those four million pound floors, 110 of them, crushed down and just killed them, just before the, 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 the semen and concrete hit them, the spirit jumped out of their body to be absent from the bodies and be present with the Lord? What if God is a whole lot more merciful than we give him credit for? Hallelujah to Jesus. 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 Hallelujah! You know why I'm talking that like this tonight, brother? Because I'm finding out that Christians are becoming increasingly suspicious of a God they can't trust. You're not even sure if you're going to make it to heaven. I just want to make it in. I just want to make it in. I just want to make it in. I've been wondering about Jesus. I just want to make it in. Look at me. We tend to doubt the outcome. We struggle with finality. We, have any we don't have any trouble with the alpha. It's the omega that we struggle with. It's not the first. It's the last. Well, I make it. If you doubt the outcome, then you doubt the out from. The Bible said he's the author and the finisher. Look at me. If you go to hell, it'll be by your own choice. So you got to get the, the hell on, heaven and hell reward and punishment thing out of your mind because it's, it's thwarting your function on this earth. You're so afraid of this God who's angry and psychotic and very intolerable and moody. If you do one thing wrong, he cuts you off. So that's why we in holiness struggle so much and have such dysfunctional lives because you don't trust God like that. You, you can't trust a God that you can't trust. You better trust him. Stop doubting him. Stop double thinking God. You're going to be all right. I was shot four times with a 32 caliber revolver. Couldn't die. The bullets bounced, bullets bounced off my chest like rocks. Didn't break the skin. I'm not afraid of the airplanes. I've flown only twice commercially. I've been usually chartering because I, didn't, I had a time schedule and I owed it to my wife and children to be able to get in and out. But it's not because I'm afraid. I'm not afraid the, the, the plane's going to fly with me in it. Not the one I'm on. I mean, it's going to fall. Not if I'm in it. I ain't through. I've got stuff to do. I'm not worried about that. Hallelujah. I'm not worried about that. I'm a child of destiny. God's hands on my life. I'm going somewhere. I just need one more year. Tell, I'll tell somebody one more time. Stand on your feet all over the building. We're going to go. I hope you listen to what I said tonight. I didn't just want you to feel it. I want you to hear me. Thank you, darling. Love yourself. Love your neighbors. you love yourself. 
being the head of my house, I have to take lead, even in saying things like, I'm sorry. I'm the head of my house. Well, if you're the head, then lead. Lead to the altar. Lead to the Most times, if there's, if there's going to be somebody to initiate, I'm sorry, it's going to be the man in my house. <laughs> she ain't going to say it first. <laughs> she may not say it at all. Don't y'all tell her I said that. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives. Before it says that, it says, wives, submit. Now, why does he say wives, submit, and husbands, love? Because women don't usually have a problem loving. They love through hell. They love when they're beaten. They love when they're abused. They just keep loving it. They have a problem submitting. <laughs> That's why he said, y'all submit. The man doesn't have trouble submitting. Okay, baby. All right. He has trouble loving. That's where we struggle, brothers. We have trouble loving. Because when we leave the dependency on our mother, sometimes we leave our mother saying, watch this, I'll never need a woman this badly again in my life. I loved and needed my mom, and nobody else will take that place. I'll never need a woman. We don't say it verbally, but in our subconscious it's there. One time I said to my wife, sweetheart, we were, we were having another one of them talks. <laughs> Lord help me. And it, before I knew anything, I had said, sweetheart, I don't feel safe when you do that. And she almost cried. She said, well, you, 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 you've never said that to me before. I've never heard you say that before. And I, I remember thinking, I didn't mean for you to hear it then. <laughs> You mean safe? I don't be telling nobody. I, I'm, I'm a man. I don't need nobody. See, a woman will say, I'm hurt. You hurt my feelings. That hurt. That just hurt. A man ain't going to say that. Instead of saying he's hurt, <clears throat> he'll assert himself. I'm a man. My house. I don't need nobody. I can do it on my own. All y'all can turn against me. <laughs> he's hurt. He ain't going to say it. He's hurt. And and, and, and anger is a signal emotion. Anger signals that there's a pain somewhere. I don't need nobody. I'm going to make it on my own. I'm a man. I'm independent. I'll see you later. I'm going to see my mom and I'll be back when I get to it. <laughs> Y'all better hear me. Dynamics of getting along with another human being. There are helpmates and there are hellmates. <laughs> Soulmates and cellmates. Come on now. Some of y'all ain't married. You're buried. Been under. You know it. And so you're struggling. Say one more year, Lord. <laughs> I ain't going to try to weed him or her. I'm going to weed me. I'm going to fertilize me. I'm going to feed the soil in my life. I'm going to make it right. Even if he doesn't change or she doesn't change, I will be able to handle things differently because I'm working on me. Wrap those arms one more time. I'd love to have you hug yourself. I'm going to turn it over to Bishop. Lord, we didn't ask to be born the first time. We don't get to choose our parents. But you do tell us to choose life. We can choose our responses to life. Help us to know that experience is not only what happens to us, it's what we do with what happens to us. There's so many bad things happening around us and it's seemingly to good people. So we're not going to ask you anymore, why did those people die? We're going to say, why didn't I die or why am I alive? Tell me that, Lord. Why am I here? Why was I birthed or born to these parents and why am I the sibling of that brother and those four sisters? Why did I marry Jean and why did I have Julian and Majesty and what am I doing in D.C. tonight and how did I meet the Owens and what's this trip all about when I rise at five o'clock in the morning to, to go catch that early flight and made this quick trip up here and back when I'm speaking to the Kiwanis tomorrow I'm running for mayor of my city 
and making these strange decisions and choices. it hurts why am I misunderstood and why do I misunderstand I must live I must die and I must live until I die and then in you I get to live again you came that I might have a life but you wanted me to have abundant life Life is time and space. I must choose how to fill it. In a moment when we get in our cars and some will walk down the cold block and drive home and slip into our apartment or our home and have a little soup or a sandwich, wash our face, and brush our teeth and slip into the bed. Thank you for a warm bed. And Thank you for some sheets and blankets and pillows. Thank you that if we can't afford a Big Mac on the way home, we can eat a peanut butter and jelly when we get there. Thank you, Lord, that there's something somewhere that, that if it ain't no man or woman in there that loves you, got a little puppy or a cat or a bird or a roach, somebody that's going to be there when they get home. Thank you, Lord. I'm not by myself. Thank you. Let me deal with it, Father. Thank you that if I don't have a fireplace, I can turn the stove on and stand in front of it. Thank you. That I'm in America. Thank you that I live in the nation's capital. Thank you that I'm here tonight. Thank you that I heard Jackie last night or I get to hear Bishop Blake's tomorrow. Thank you that I heard the preacher tonight. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you for the intelligence of the Holy. Thank you that my best days are still in front of me. Thank you that I have one more year. Thank you that you let me cross over one more time and I get to fertilize and dig around and make it better. Thank you for giving me some power to change some things in my own life. Thank you, Jesus. I go from this place strong, full of the Spirit of God. Every tumor, every cyst, every growth, every migraine headache, every spirit of infirmity, every sickness, I renounce it. I bind it by the power of the Holy Ghost. Loose that man. Every ulcer, cancer, the Lord rebuke you. Death, God binds you. Take your hands off God's people. Loose us from every habit, every hobby, every hunger that's unholy. Thank you, Jesus for the anointing that is destroying the yokes of bondage. Young man, young woman, little boy, little girl, single person, widow, divorcee, whoever you are, in the name of Jesus, be whole, be healed in yourself, in your soul, in your mind, in your body, in your attitude, in your perspective, in your perceptions. Strengthen us. Thank you, Lord. And I lift up my hands and accept one more year. Come on, get them up right now. I accept one more year. I accept the next hour. I wave last year goodbye. I wave the last decade. I wave the last millennium goodbye. I accept where I am today and where I'm going tomorrow. Thank you, Lord, that you've given me another chance. Thank you. I seize the moment in the name of Jesus. For greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can and I will. And no weapon formed against me will prosper. I will pay my bills. I will get out of debt. I will live healthy, happy, holy lives. I will manage my pain, modify my behavior, and learn some coping mechanisms. I will. Hallelujah. Turn to somebody and say, I'm a new person. God just gave me another year. I give you this year. I give it to you. I give it to you. You don't have to pay for it. It's a gift. It's yours. Seize it. And remember, God's going to give you increase in favor this year. Abraham and Sarah got anxious. They got tired of waiting. Well, let me tell you what the Lord wants to give you. He's not going to give you what you worked for this time. He's going to give you what you've been waiting for. What you've been waiting for? What you've been waiting for? What have you been waiting for? My God, what have you been waiting for? God's about to give you what you've been waiting for. You shall faint and be weary. Young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. 
Look at someone and say, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. I see me running through an open door. I believe I can fly, and I believe you can too. I believe you can fly. Come on, everybody. I believe I can fly. Come on. I believe I can touch. Come on, reach up, reach up, reach up. I think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly. I believe I can soar. I see me running through an open door. Oh, I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. Ten is the number of divine order. Whatever else you give tonight, I want I hope nobody will give less than ten.